Welcome. Students and teachers, gardeners and friends of birds, butterflies, and pollinators of all stripes. My name is Janine Mitchell. I serve on Doylestown Township's Environmental Advisory Council. This evening, Dr. Tallamy's topic is Restoring Nature's Relationships. Please welcome Dr. Doug Tallamy. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Got to uh, apologize right away. I'm getting a serious frog in my throat tonight, so that happens. Um, I'm always impressed when, when people would actually come out on a rainy night to hear me. I would never do that. <laughs> actually, I, uh, uh, there's an, an event in southern Ohio in the summer called Mothapalooza. And this summer I took some students to Mothapalooza. But on the way I had to stop in Columbus, Ohio and give a talk to uh, the Grange Audubon. <clears throat> Uh, so we walked into th this auditorium, there's a lot of people there, and one of the students leans over to me and, and says, is this a conference? And I said, no, it's just me. He said, these people are here just to hear you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've never, never figured that out. <clears throat> okay, you know, we're going to talk about uh, restoring nature's relationships, and the first thing I want to do is ask you what that bird is. That's a Quetzal, Resplenda Quetzal. Uh, it's an endangered species in the forests of Central America, and it's endangered for one primary reason, has a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the wild avocado tree, you don't have quetzals. And we've cut down most of the wild avocado trees. Um, but we figured out we want those birds in our future, so we actually can help bring them back by planting wild avocado trees. Uh, and that's what these folks are doing right here. Those are the trees right there. But fortunately, they grow pretty quickly, and they reach the age at which they produce those fruits in not too many years. And it's starting to look better for the future of that beautiful bird. But that same conservation scenario is repeated time and time again, particularly in the tropics. If you want to save the jaguar, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Well, not all palm trees make coconuts. There are many that make what we call palm nuts. And that happens to be the favorite food of peccaries, which is the favorite food of jaguars. So we're talking about specialization in the natural world, particularly focused on food webs as being the rule not the exception, and it always starts with plants. Uh, now again, a lot of people think you get all that specialization in the, the tropical areas of the world because there is so much of it. But we have a great deal of specialization up here in the temperate zone as well, and some of the most specialized relationships that have developed anywhere on the planet occur right in our yards. This is one of them. This is the, the bola spider. It's a female hanging from a, a river birch leaf in my yard. It's obvious why she's called the bola spider. She doesn't spin a web. She simply drops a single strand of silk and puts a sticky glob of glue at the end there. Uh, and she doesn't swing it around her head like a, a bolus. But she, does, she seems to go fishing with it. She lowers it and raises it and lowers it real slowly. And the first time I watched her do that, I told her, you're not going to catch anything. Can you imagine something flying into that by, by accident? And of course, that's the way I used to fish, and I didn't catch anything. But about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and got stuck on her sticky glob of glue, and she, she wheeled it in and actually laid her, her eggs on it. <clears throat> uh, well, what I didn't know at the time is that that was not an accident. She was releasing the sex pheromone of that particular species of moth. That's a male. He thought she was a female. She is, but the wrong species. Uh, so that was the end of him. And it turns out that every species of bola spider mimics the sex pheromone of one species of moth. So you can have a bola spider in your yard if you have the plant that supports the larval development of the moth that your bola spider is mimicking the sex pheromone of. Highly sophisticated relationship. This is Phlox variceta, very common spring ephemeral, uh, particularly in these, these parts. And it spreads readily from seed if it's pollinated. But if you look at the entrance to the corolla there, it's extremely narrow. I've watched native bees land on these flowers, try to get their tongues in there, and they can't do it. So who's pollinating our flocks? Uh, well, if you watch them carefully, you'll see it's day-flying sphinx moths, things like the hummingbird sphinx or the snowberry clear wing. These guys have very long tongues. They sink them straight into that corolla, and when they pull them out, they're covered with pollen. Then they fly to the next fl flower, and they're really efficient pollinators. So you can get your flocks to, to produce seed if you have adult snowberry clear wings. And you can have adult snowberry clear wings if you have larval snowberry clear wings. And you can have larval snowberry clearings if you have coral honeysuckle, which is its host plant. 
<clears throat> that, of course, is the native honeysuckle. Even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationships with plants often do, at least at one part of their life cycle. And I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, that's the primary uh, species of chickadee that we have in this area. And we always think of them as seed eaters because all winter long they're at our, our feeders. One of the most common birds at our feeders eating seeds. But when it comes time to make more chickadees, they become caterpillar specialists. The, bird, the baby birds cannot eat seeds, so they feed them caterpillars. And if they're in a very rich environment, they will feed them almost exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out that they're not exceptions. <clears throat> most birds that are out there are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars, or adult caterpillars. There's a moth there. So let's ask the question, why caterpillars? What is special about those caterpillars? Well, it could be because they're beautiful. There are a lot of beautiful caterpillars out there, like the Pandora Sphinx the Coletta silk moth, the spiny rose caterpillar, our black swallowtail, very beautiful, hieroglyphic moth, spun glass caterpillar, that's my favorite. Or it could be because they have cool names, like the green marvel, the, con the once charred punky, confused wood grain, the cynical ground cat, the neighbor, the Donald. <laughs> <coughs> Could be, could be. <laughs> I actually don't think, though, it's because they're beautiful, they have cool names. I think there's some very practical reasons, um, like being soft. Most of these caterpillars are soft, and that means you can stuff them down the throat of your, your babies without fear of injuring them. Uh, but it's probably largely because they're, they're so, so nutritious. They're very high in protein, they're high in lipids and fats, and it turns out they're, they're the best source of carotenoids for birds during the period when they're, they're breeding. Now, later on in the season, birds can get a lot of carotenoids from berries, uh, but there aren't any berries early in the spring. So what's a carotenoid? That's a carotenoid, and plants make a lot of different types of carotenoids, and only plants. So we vertebrates can't make carotenoids. Uh, and it turns out that there are a number of carotenoids that appear to be essential for healthy diets <clears throat> for both us and birds. And that's why my wife, Cindy, tells me I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene, have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. <clears throat> and she makes sure that, that I eat that stuff. Well, why? They're antioxidants. They run around our bodies and they, they uh, prevent um, uh, oxidation, oxidative damage to DNA. They stimulate the immune system. So you're just generally more healthy if you have a lot of carotenoids. Improve color vision. Now, when your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better, it turns out she was right. She didn't know she was right, but she, but she was right. Improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? Improve sexual attractiveness. This is the birds now. They're taking the pigments from the carotenoids and putting them in their feathers, particularly the males. So this, this uh, vermilion flycatcher is bright red because he had access to a lot of carotenoids. And, of course, if the brighter red he is, the more females he attracts. Uh, well, chickadees can't make their own carotenoids. They're vertebrate just like us, so they've got to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants, so they have to get them from something that did eat plants. And yes, that something is insects, but that's the key. Caterpillars have about twice as many carotenoids as other types of insects. We're not sure why, but that seems to be the case, uh, which means for most birds, caterpillars um, may not be optional parts of the diet. They seem to be essential. And that means if you're a bird and you're in an area where there's not enough caterpillars, you're not going to be able to successfully reproduce. I mean, almost enough caterpillars isn't good enough. You need enough. Um, so that's the next question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? Well, it takes a lot, and it was these birds that, that taught me that. I put a little chickadee box up in my, my uh, yard, and I put it low so I could take pictures of what, what these birds were take, bringing back to the nest. That's when I learned they were bringing back caterpillars. I also learned they brought them back really quickly. So both the male and the female chickadee are, are cooperating when they're foraging, so there's always somebody out looking for a caterpillar. And they can bring one back to the nest once every three minutes. <clears throat> in one 27-minute period, they brought back 30 caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time. Sometimes a whole bunch. <clears throat> And they're doing this all day long from, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., working very hard. Now, the next question is, how many species of caterpillars do they, do they bring back? 
Well, in a three hour period, they brought back 17 species of caterpillars. Let me remind you, these chickadees are foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you need what they need within 50 meters of, of the nest. Uh, so in, in, in my yard, in three hours, they found 17 different species of, of caterpillars. That's important, because if I had one or two species of caterpillars, and it happened to be a bad year for those species, there wouldn't be nearly enough caterpillars for these chickadees to, to rear their young. But if I have 17 species, or 34 species, or 134 species, and I'm, I'm actually counting them now, I've got a lot more than that, then there's always some combination of species, no matter how bad the weather was, that will be common enough. So in, in combination, there'll be enough caterpillars and the chickadees will be able to reproduce. In other words, the diversity in this food web is creating stability in the food web. Regardless of the weather, the chickadees will be able to breed every year. And this is a bird that only lives about three years, so that's, that's important. You wanna be able to breed every single year. <clears throat> Well, in 1961, uh, a man by the name of Brewer decided he would count all the, the caterpillars the Carolina chickadees brought back to the nest every single day. I have no idea why he wanted to do that, but, but he did it, and he found out it was between 390 and 570, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. Uh, and they do that, they, they rear their young for about 16 days before the young fledge. Now, after they fledge, after they leave the nest, the adults continue to feed them caterpillars for another 30 days but then you can't follow them then, so nobody knows how many caterpillars that is. But just to the point where they're leaving the, the nest, that's between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars required to raise one clutch of chickadees. And these are tiny birds, third of an ounce, that's four pennies worth of, worth of bird. What if we wanted to make a red-bellied woodpecker? Eight times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And of course, we don't want just chickadees and red-bellied woodpeckers in our neighborhoods. We want a diversity of bird communities. We want scarlet tanagers, our tufted titmice, our blue jays, our, our uh, what is that? Bluebirds, yes, bluebirds, tree swallows, common yellow throats, indigo bunnings, towhees, yellow warblers, wood thrushes, wrens, and cardinals, and, and hummingbirds. These are all common birds that we expect to be in our neighborhoods, but we never think about what it takes for these things to breed. And we don't want just one pair breeding, we want a population of each of these species in our neighborhoods. Just imagine the tremendous number of caterpillars required to make these guys, uh, enable them to reproduce. Now I know what you're saying, oh, these hummingbirds aren't eating insects, they eat, they eat sugar water. Well, actually 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders. And of course, spiders needed insects to become spiders. <clears throat> then they eat the sugar water. And that is true for 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America. They are rearing their young on either directly or indirectly on insect protein. When I say indirectly, I mean, again, a lot of them are eating spiders, but the spiders first ate an insect. And this is news to a lot of people. A lot of people think, well, birds are eating seeds and berries. People who write Landscape for Birds books think birds eat seeds and berries, and they do, they do. So they recommend putting plants in your yard that make seeds and berries, but we also have, the, have to have the plants in our yards that make the insects, that create the insects, create the birds so that they can eat seeds and berries. It's a new message that people are just starting to think about, but without insects, we're not gonna have baby birds. Oh, get out of here, you. Okay, how do we do this? What types of, of landscapes are capable of producing the abundance and diversity of, of insects that we're talking about here? Well, to answer that question, we have to consider the most common type of specialized relationship, and that's the relationship between or the cloud. <laughs> All right, the relationship between um, the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So I'm not talking about pollinators here, I'm talking about things like this polyphemus moth and the oak tree that it's eating. <clears throat> Remember, plants really don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. Uh, and it's, a, it's an amazingly effective defense that has kept most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why during the summertime we can look outside and it's green. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat the plants that are around them. They're simply too toxic. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. 
about 90% of the insects eat plant, that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They pick one or two lineages of plants that share a common cocktail of chemical defenses, and they develop the adaptations required to circumvent those, those defenses. They develop the, the uh, enzymes that allow them to store and, and excrete and break down those, those compounds, detoxify them, the behavioral adaptations that allow them to avoid them in, in uh, space, the uh, life history adaptations that allow them to avoid them in time, but it takes a long period of evolutionary exposure for all these adaptations to fall into place. Does not happen overnight. Let's use red cedar as an example. Eastern red cedar, uh, it of course is a conifer. It's been in our, our landscapes for hundreds of millions of years. So it's been interacting with insects right from the start. You think that is plenty of time for all the insects to adapt to the defenses of red cedar. Uh, but that hasn't happened. There are actually very few things that are able to eat red cedar because it's found a really toxic monoterpene to protect its, protect its leaves, called beta thuya plixin. But this is a, an insect that has found a way around it. This is the juniper hair streak, and it is a specialist on red cedar. And all that means is it's, a, it's able to eat beta thuya plixin without dying. <clears throat> and that's the upside of specialization. The downside of specialization is that now that's all it can eat. So by developing the adaptations that allow it to get around beta thuya plixin, it has not developed the adaptations that allow it to get around the tannins that are in oaks, or the cucurbitacins that are in cucurbits, or the nicotine in tobacco, or the cyanide in cherries, and so on. And what that means is, if we don't landscape in a way that includes red cedar, we don't have this butterfly, because that's all it can eat. If you're gonna eat red cedar, you might as well look like it. That's the caterpillar right there. This is called Crypsis. And of course, these caterpillars are trying to hide from those birds that are trying to eat them. Um, and blending in with what you're eating is a really good way to do it. It's another advantage of specialization. As a matter of fact, everything that eats red cedar is highly cryptic. This is the curved line angle right there. There it is up close. And this is the juniper geometer right here that's blending in with the dead parts of, of red cedar. Uh, so Crypsis is very, very common out there, but in today's world, these types of specialized adaptations have become a curse because we humans haven't paid attention to them. We're moving plants willy-nilly all over the place, particularly bringing plants from Asia over here. And of course, every time you plant a plant from Asia, you're, you're putting it in a space where a native plant used to be. And it's the native plants that have those specialized interactions with, with the insects, whereas plants from someplace else have not been here long enough for all those adaptations to fall into place. And nothing illustrates this better than, than the monarch butterfly. That's the monarch larva, of course, and they are specialists on milkweed. And you've all heard what's, what's happening to our monarchs. We haven't been very nice to our milkweeds over the years. We've never shared our residential or corporate landscapes very well with, with milkweeds. Um, they've always just kind of been around in the fringe of, of agriculture, uh, and, and that's been, been good enough. But now we've adopted clean agriculture. We have a new agriculture culture agriculture um, that says if you have weeds on the side of your field you're a low-class farmer so now we've got manicured lawns on the side of, of most of our fields and the weed the weeds are gone all those weeds are native plants it, it you know it reminds me we just have a marketing issue here if we hadn't called them weeds maybe they'd still be there we got milkweed and Joe pie weed and New York iron weed and, and Joe or poke weed. Everything is a weed. So of course people think they have to go. But those are the things that are maintaining the monarch. Those are the things that are maintaining the 4,000 species of native bees that did all the pollination in North America before we brought the honeybee over here. All the other butterflies that are out there need those weeds. So when we eliminate them from the landscape, they disappear. And that's exactly what's happened to the monarch. There's only 3% of the, of the monarch population left compared to what was here in 1976. <clears throat> and this may be the most iconic insect in the world. It's got that fantastic 3,000 mile uh, migration. And it's disappearing because we've taken away its host plant. Now this is a learning opportunity uh, for the US because it points out how important host plant specialization is. It also points out how easy it is to bring these things back. You just have to plant milkweeds. Actually, with the monarchs, we have to plant milkweeds and the flowers that bloom in the fall, things like fall asters, so they have enough forage to get down to Mexico uh, when, they, when they migrate. 
Of course, the reason we know the monarch is disappearing is because they all go to one place in Mexico, we can count them. Nothing else is doing that. So if we don't count it, we think it's okay, but actually the other things are, are, are disappearing as well. And we need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to that because it's not just the monarch that's a specialist. It's not just caterpillars and, and, and uh, moths and butterflies that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle. It only eats elderberry. If we get rid of all our elderberry, this beetle disappears. This is the dogbane beetle, only eats dogbane. The sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a Korea bug that only eats ash. So if the emerald ash borer takes out all of our ashes, we will lose this species. Dave Wagner just finished a paper in uh, University of Connecticut. He found that 95 species depend on ash. They'll all disappear. <coughs> Excuse me. Just have to bear with me here. 95 species disappear, and that is because of this figure here, the fact that 90% of the insects that eat plants depend on particular host plants. If we take those host plants away, those species will disappear. Well, we can actually use this knowledge of host plant specialization to purposely rebuild food webs wherever we want. So let's do it at home. Let's build the food web of a white-eyed vireo. And I'm gonna use that as an example because that's the nest my wife found in, in our yard a few years ago. <clears throat> it was low so I could take pictures of what the, the uh, adults were feeding their, their young, and then we can work backwards. We know what the species of caterpillar is. We know a lot about what these caterpillars eat. So then we can know what the plant was required to make the caterpillar that's feeding these babies. Uh, and if you're trying to build this food bed, you just plant that plant and everything will be fine. So let's do that for a second. Uh, that caterpillar is the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. We've got a lot of black cherry at our house, making blinded sphinx moths so the babies get to eat. This little guy is the chestnut shizura, and despite its common name, it's a specialist on native viburnums. Now, our house, our, our property was mowed for hay before we moved in. Not many plants there, especially after a mowing. Uh, but we put in a lot of plants in them, and the, the uh, viburnum that we put in is arrowwood, viburnum dentatum. It's now making chestnut shizura so the babies get to eat again. <clears throat> this is the drab prominent right here. It's a specialist on sycamore. And we did not plant sycamore, uh, but about 13 years ago, there was a big wind, blew in some sycamore seeds from someplace. One landed in my cold frame and it, it germinated and I'm not very fast at weeding things out. So it's now over 40 feet tall. <laughs> but it is making drab prominence and the babies get to eat again. And on and on we go. This is the eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the, the uh, spicebush swallowtail. This is the eye that's supposed to, to convince the bird that it's a tree snake. Didn't work. It's a specialist on spicebush and its close relative sassafras. We have both of those. The tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherries emerging is a really important component of this bird's food web. But these guys are hungry, so they need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut into the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray-edged bomaloka, the black blotch caesura, the bride, all specialists on, on black walnut. We have native maples. We get plagodes inchworms, the green striped maple worm, the retarded dagger moth. I don't make up these names, really. Uh, native, native elms, this is the American elm, give us the four-horned sphinx, the double-toothed prominent, the interrupted dagger moth. Remember, 90% of the insects you want to use to rebuild this food web won't be in your yard if you don't have the plant that makes those, those insects. So if you want the mustard sallow, you need witch hazel. If you want the hackberry emperor, you need hackberry. If you want cuculeo asteroides, you need native asters. If you want the arcidura flower moth and the, owl, the brown hooded owlet, you need goldenrod. You want the hog sphinx, the Pandora sphinx, the abbot sphinx, you need Virginia creeper. The red bud leaf roller needs red bud, the gray furcula needs native willows, the turbulent phosphilla needs greenbrier, and the orange tufted oneida and the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the pleasant dagger moth, the delightful dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and many, many more won't be there if you don't have oaks, because they are the most powerful plant you can put in your yard. Why do we want, by the way, you know where I took all those pictures? 
map cube. <laughs> my front yard. I took them in my front yard. I hear all the time, we've got to build backyard habitat as if it's so ugly, we've got to hide it in the backyard. You can put an oak tree in your front yard. It'll be okay. Why do we want all these insects? Well, the birds need them, yes. But um, it turns out that insects are just vital components of, of terrestrial food webs. There's no two ways around it. So, for example, all spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that ate insects. And I know a lot of people don't like spiders, but look who does. It is the second most important component of bird food webs. We don't want to lose our spiders if we like birds. And they're also really important predators that help keep things in, in check. Then we have a bunch of insect predators that are eating the insect herbivores. If we lost the herbivores, we'd lose the predators, and they themselves are part of food webs. If we lost the insects, we would lose our frogs, we would lose our toads, we would lose all the amphibians, because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, as a matter of fact. We always think of rodents as seed eaters, uh, and they do. Uh, eat seeds, but only when they can't find enough, enough insects. And the reason is insects are really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. Uh, and insects have those, those uh, organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, and it allows these little guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do, because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. Same reason larger organisms are eating insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is digging up the yard to get the grubs in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects, raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like, like the red fox. 25% of, of the red fox's diet is insects, a full quarter of its, of its diet. 23% of a black bear's diet. Doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. Even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk, and it's a bird predator. And you might think, well, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have sharp shin hawks, but think about it. The birds this guy's eating needed insects to become birds. So he needs them indirectly. So does the garter snake. It's not eating, not eating uh, insects directly, but it's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. So where were that insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And E.O. Wilson's never wrong. This is why this is a message for everybody, not just the people who like birds and butterflies and bees, it's, it's a message for, for the guy in the heart of Beijing or, or Manhattan. It doesn't matter. Everybody on the planet needs healthy biological diversity because that is what's running the ecosystems that supports us. Well, what's happening to all those things, all those insectivores we're talking about? Um, we don't measure it in most, most cases. There's some very broad statistics from the World Wildlife uh, uh, Fund or Foundation that says we've lost 50% or and actually it's 52% of the world's, the global wildlife in the last 40 years. That's not, a, that's not a happy statistic. But we do measure birds. We have something called the State of the Birds Report. It comes out every year. Two years ago, 2014, State of the Birds Report said we had 230 species of birds in North America at risk of extinction. 230 species. When I grew up, it was the whooping crane and the, and the California condor. That's it. Now it's 230. Just two years later, 430 species of birds at risk of extinction. That's not a happy trend there. 50% fewer songbirds today than, than just 40 years ago. So our birds are not happy, and they're not happy because the ecosystems supporting them are not happy. And of course, those are the same ecosystems supporting us. That's why we have to pay attention to this. But what's, what's going on here? We have parks and preserves. Why aren't they preserving the biodiversity that we need them to, to preserve? It's, it's simply not working. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Let's just talk about one of them, uh, and, and it's very simple. They're not big enough. They are too small. They are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a small area, it doesn't have to be that small. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations, and that's the problem because small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. Bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, that top line there, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, often in those, those uh, random swings, you, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize, you're permanently gone. 
And these days, it's harder and harder to recolonize because our habitat patches are so, uh, so fragmented, so, dis so uh, isolated from each other. Very tough to get, get around. Imagine a box turtle crossing Route 95. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And studies all over the, the, the world, and some of them quite lengthy, 100 years in length, are telling us the same things. The natural areas we've left on this planet are not large enough to sustain the nature we need them to sustain. And unfortunately, that includes our largest national parks. So not only have we fragmented the natural world into these little isolated fragments, but we, we brought in uh, what we call invasive species, animals and plants from someplace else that are aggressively displacing native, native communities. Uh, 3,300 species of non-native plants that are considered invasive. So let's make sure we understand the definition of invasive. Uh, it's got to be a non-native, and it's got to be displacing native plants. So I've heard people say, talk about native plants and call them invasive. What they mean is they're aggressive. We do have aggressive native plants that, that, that duke it out with other native plants like they always have done. That's a natural interaction. But what's happening here is we've got plants largely from Asia and Europe that are displacing our native plants. That's not natural because it's happening way too fast. We brought them over and in a blink of an evolutionary eye, uh, they're, they're rearranging our, our plant communities. This is White Clay Creek State Park. I drive by it on the way to work when I, when I go to University of Delaware. Uh, and, and this is what it looks like in March. <clears throat> now in March, it turns out that plants, particularly from Asia, leaf out before plants from North America. So this is the time to look at your natural areas and anything that's green doesn't belong there. And that's what you're looking at here in, in White Clay Creek State Park. Got all of our friends here, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, Japanese honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, miscanthus, barberry, burning bush, um, calorie pear, alanthus, Norway maple, privet. They're all there and every one of them is escaping from our garden. So we don't have to wonder where these guys came from. We bring them in, we sell them in our nurseries, and then they end up in White Clay Creek, where a third, a full third of the vegetation is now from Asia. And it has not been there long enough to support any of the, the um, specialized relationships that I was talking about earlier. Now we can measure what happens when you allow this to happen, when, when non-native plants displace native plants, either through uh, invasions or because we plant them in, in our yards. It doesn't have to be invasive if we plant it there, it's still displacing a native plant. What happens to local food webs? That's what we've been measuring in my lab for the last 12 years. I have lots of papers on it. You can go to the literature and read them all. And I know you're not going to do that, but I'll make it easy for you. We always get the same answer. Uh, and it is going to be launched. It says October 1st here, but they keep finding glitches. They say they've got it. They've got it done. And it's going to be up two weeks. So I would say, what, maybe November 10th, something like that. Um, there's the, the uh, URL. Um, and the idea is that you can put your zip code in and the ranked list for your county anywhere in the country will come up. And it will be able to pin, help you pinpoint the most productive plants wherever you live. So it should be a very useful tool. So it's on the National Wildlife uh, Federation website called Native Plant Finder. Everybody got that copied down? <clears throat> okay. Well, making these lists uh, helped us recognize uh, a pattern which was actually always obvious, but um, sometimes takes me a while. Uh, that, again, there's really just a few of the genera that are out there in your local, local area that are doing most of the work. They're producing most of the food. So I started calling them foraging hubs. I borrowed that term from people who study uh, fruiting trees in the tropics. I've learned that people don't, don't like that term, so... Um, so you can call them core genera, you can call them keystone genera, you can call them the hostess with the mostess, whatever you want to call them. Um, but the pattern is, I think it's represented very well by the Delta Airline magazine. I noticed this, I was sitting on Delta on the runway one day, not going anywhere. Uh, and that's what the magazine looks like. And those, of course, are Delta hubs. And I said, gee, that looks just like foraging hubs there. Let's make them foraging hubs. Now, each line that goes into those plants it could be a bird, it could be a species of bird, um, but it's going there to get food. It's foraging on the oak tree or the cherry tree or the willow tree. Uh, the black dots are other plants in that landscapes, in that landscape. And the birds or the lizards are going to those other plants, but not very much. 
because there's not very much food there. So imagine what happens if we take these, these really key genera out of that landscape. You have all those other plants there, but they're not going to be producing enough food. That will be a failed, web, a failed food web, a collapsed food web. And it turns out further that about 5% of the genera in your local area are producing between 73 and 75% of the food. That's why we're calling them, them really important. We'll call them core, core species, core genera. Let's flip that on its head. That means you could build a landscape in your restoration using 95% of the native plants in your area, and it would only produce between 25 and 27% of the food if you don't use those, those foraging hubs, those core genera. That's so useful information. It's really easy to fail in doing this, but if you know what your core genera on, it's really easy to, to succeed. Uh, and it turns out that this pattern is, is um, it's a really solid one. It occurs everywhere. If you look at the bioregions across the US, each one of those colors is a different bioregion, uh, and the same pattern exists in each one of those bioregions. It exists in the north, it exists in the south, it exists in areas where you've got a lot of plant diversity and, and uh, much less plant diversity. Um, so that's good. Wherever we go, there are core genera that are necessary to run the, web, the, the food webs in our, our area. So we, we make sure we have them, uh, and after we have them, then we can diversify using all these other available genera. Around here, of course, it is oaks. 557 species of, of caterpillars use oaks as host plants. And, you know, if you don't like caterpillars, call them bird food. 557 species of bird food. What does that mean? You know, it's a relative term, but let's compare it to ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia, used as a, as a street tree all the time. <clears throat> well, there are four species of caterpillars recorded on ginkgo, uh, and it turns out they're all mistakes. So there's actually no species of caterpillars that use ginkgo. If you ever see a caterpillar eating a ginkgo tree, take a picture of it and send it to me. I've been saying that for years now. I still don't have any pictures. This is what they always look like. It just, just seems that nothing, nothing can eat it. But even if those are good host records, um, four versus 557, which would you plant if you're trying to, to support your, your local, local animal diversity? Number two in the list are, are native prunus, so things like uh, black cherry and pin cherry and American plum and, and uh, beach plum. 456 species of, of bird food on prunus. Let's compare that to zelkova that we're all planting everywhere. I guess because it looks like it looks like uh, the elms that we lost to Dutch elm disease. Of course, uh, you know, ginkgo and, and zelkova from, from Asia. No caterpillars on, on zelkova, and that's what it looks like. And if your goal is to have a plant that is perfect in your yard, that is not interacting with anything, zelkova is for you. But I suggest you get a silk uh, zelkova or a plastic one, and then you can put it in your yard. You don't have to water it, and it'll look just like that and be just as productive. Then you can have the perfect dead landscape if that is your, if that is your goal. Okay, Pieris japonica is the, the uh, probably the most common foundation plant that we have in this, this uh, country. You know, they're native Pieris, but they're not very productive. Only two species recorded on our native Pieris, <clears throat> which just illustrates that not all natives are equal. We got these really productive ones and a whole bunch that are supporting some things, but not that, that much. Well, it could be a native viburnum that's supporting 103 species. These are the decisions we're making when we, when we landscape our, our yards. So try to think of the, the plants in your yard as if they were bird feeders, because that's exactly what they could be if you choose the right species. So there you go, they're bird, bird feeders. Now, you get to decide how well you're going to feed the birds. You can feed them uh, a lot or just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like. They're giant lawns with very few bird feeders in them. You could put seed in your bird feeders. The birds really aren't eating the feeders. They're eating the seed in your feeders or caterpillars in your feeders. Or you could keep them empty. There's the ginkgo right there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any food. So the choices are, are yours. And when we landscape without this in mind, without using those, those core genera, those foraging hubs, we're not fooling the birds. Here's some data from, from my uh, PhD student, Desiree Naranjo, who's working with chickadees, Carolina chickadees in the, the suburbs of Washington, D.C. She's following 93 pairs of breeding chickadees and, and looking at the breeding success in relation to the landscape in which they are, are breeding. So the star for this pair of chickadees is where the nest is. The red line represents 
the foraging area. That's that 50 meters from, from the nest. Um, and the blue areas represent 95% of their foraging effort. Those are the plants on which they're getting the food that they're feeding their, their babies from. So let's look at what those are. Well, those are all the native trees in, in the area. Basswood, sweet gum, American elm, cherry, black cherry, two species of oaks. Now, equally informative are the trees they're not going to. They're there, but the chickadees are ignoring them. Crepe myrtles, there's our friend the ginkgo, silk tree, Japanese maple, saucer magnolia. These are all the trees from Asia that, that are so common in our, our landscapes. And it's very easy to picture a landscape that, where those are the, the dominant uh, plants. And when that happens, this happens. This is a uh, failed nest in Desiree's study. And after she took the three dead chicks out of the nest, she noticed there were a bunch of sunflower seeds in the bottom of the nest. <clears throat> and what she thinks happened is the parents simply ran out of caterpillars when they were trying to feed their babies. Somebody had a bird feeder up, so they tried to feed them uh, bird, bird seed. Uh, and of course, they can't eat bird seed, so they starve to death. There are real consequences to the plants that we choose to landscape with. Now, she's also looking at the migrants, the migrating birds that stop, that, that use her, her residential neighborhoods in D.C as stopover points, resting areas during their migration. She's got 51 species that have stopped so far. You know, birds uh, migrate, and on a good night, they can make up to 300 miles uh, in the night, but then they, they typically rest during the day because they're exhausted. After 300 miles, they're out of gas. They do use fuel really efficiently. They use it at the rate of 720,000 miles per gallon. So pretty efficiently, but after 300 miles, they're still out of gas, they have to come down, they have to rest, but they really have to eat. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, they're out of luck, because there's nothing to eat there. Uh, and if we're wondering why our birds are disappearing, this has got to be one, one of the reasons. We're simply not supporting them with the food where we are. So you don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but I do encourage you to think about saving it where you live, because we're pretty much everywhere. Your little piece of the world is an important component of your local ecosystem. If everybody opts out of contributing to that ecosystem, it collapses. So you do have a very important conservation role. Okay, we've moved uh, plants and animals all over the world, creating what ecologists call novel ecosystems. And a novel ecosystem is simply one in which the organisms are meeting each other for the first time in evolutionary history. And what that means is they have not had the time to develop those specialized relationships that I was talking about earlier. And if you don't have the specialized relationships in these novel ecosystems, you're losing species. You're draining all these specialized species from those, those ecosystems. Just like the monarch is disappearing from agricultural ecosystems now, because it's lost its, its specialized relationship with, with uh, milkweed. Well, if we're losing species, let's ask the question, how many species do we need? How many do we humans need? Let's be selfish about it. <clears throat> well, I'm going to argue that we need all of them. We need all of the species because it is these species in our ecosystems that are running the ecosystems, that are creating what we call ecosystem services, those things that keep us alive. We should call them biodiversity services because it's really the plants and animals, the biodiversity that are creating these surfaces. And of course, uh, that, We've already measured the Earth's ability to support us. That was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment back in 2005. And there, this was hundreds of scientists from around the world. It took them five years to do it. But their unhappy conclusion uh, was that we've already degraded the planet's ability to support us by 60%. That's the same thing as shrinking planet Earth by 60%. At the same time, we're increasing the human population. Anybody can see that is not a sustainable proposition. That's the ocean, by the way. It's not a recycling plant, and this poor guy's going out to fish. <clears throat> well, why don't we let all the natural areas that we have make the ecosystem services we need? Of course, that's, that's what we've done in the past. We have gotten this far because we had very rich natural areas that, that produced what I call ecological interest. We've been living off that interest, but we've used up the interest, and now we're dipping into the ecological principle. We're degrading those ecosystems, so each year they produce fewer services. And we do that because we're everywhere. We're everywhere. It's us, it's our corn or soybeans, our cattle, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. We only have 5% of the US, it's relatively pristine. We've turned it into gone with the wind here because aesthetics have trumped everything. We've always thought there's a lot of healthy nature out there. Humans are here, nature's someplace else, and there's plenty of it. 
Uh, well, not so anymore. This landscape is pretty uh, in, a, in a certain sense, but was it built to create the ecosystem services we're talking about? Was it built to share with other living things? No, that wasn't the goal. Uh, but it could have been, it could have been. We've got to raise the bar about what we've asked our landscapes to do in the past. <clears throat> we've asked them to be pretty in the past, but today uh, they have to support life. If we don't support life where humans are, it's going to disappear because we're everywhere. Of course, if it disappears, so will the ecosystem, so will we. I can't say that too many times. They have to sequester carbon. We've got way too much carbon in the air. A third of it has come from the plants we have removed from the planet. It's, it's as a gas up in the air now. If we put those plants back, and we could, in a lot of places anywhere, we could sequester a lot of carbon. Not only in the plants themselves, but they pump it into the ground. Our soils have the ability to hold seven times the amount of carbon that is currently in the atmosphere. So we don't, look, we don't need fancy geoengineering solutions to climate change. We just need to put the carbon back in the soil. And it's plants that do that. They pump it in through their roots, enriching the soil. We also have to clean and, and manage water. In other words, we have, to have, we have to manage our watersheds at home. Everybody lives in a watershed. Nobody has the right to wreck that watershed. But we haven't thought about that. We have a giant lawn, that's exactly what it's, what it's doing. And we have to support our pollinators at home. Not enough nature to do it anymore. And now it's politically correct to support pollinators. So you are allowed to do that. Why do you want to support pollinators? I know what you're going to say, because they pollinate our crops. Well, that's, that's one reason. They pollinate a third of our crops. Uh, but actually, they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Forget our crops. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. Simply not an option. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. And I am flabbergasted that I didn't hear about this in our presidential debates. Because <clears throat> it really is essential. All right, there's a family that lives in this, this house. If they're not generating all of the ecosystem services that they need at home, they're going to have to borrow them from someplace. Now, in the past, we borrowed them from nature. Not enough nature anymore. I don't think they're going to borrow them from their neighbor, because he's not making any either. I don't think they're going to borrow them from their township's open space. If it looks like my township's open space, which is a paved path around a giant mowed lawn, and people walk in circles around it. <clears throat> we think if there's not a building on it, it's good land stewardship. But that is not good land stewardship. Either is that. Think of that list of what we have to raise the bar and do. That, that lawn isn't doing anything. It's, it's not supporting pollinators. It's not supporting food webs. It's not, not sequestering carbon. By the way, a lawn, you know, the lawn industry will tell you your lawn sequesters carbon, 120 pounds per acre. And that's true. But a meadow support, sequesters 3,000 pounds per acre, and a forest sequesters 3,500 pounds per acre. Which are you going to choose if you want to sequester carbon? And managing watersheds, I mean, that's the worst thing you can do for a watershed. All that does is, is decrease infiltration and increase pollution. So simply from a watershed management perspective alone, we have to decrease the area that's in, in lawn. We've measured it in this area. 92% of the area that could be landscaped is lawn. 92%. Only 10% of the tree biomass that we could have in our yards is there. We've thrown out 90%. So if we're trying to sequester carbon, calorie repair is not the answer here. It'll hold it for 10 years or 30 years and then fall over in the ice storm and release it all. Uh, and it never gets very big. We've got to get the big guys back in here. They're going to hold it for hundreds of years and pump a lot of it into our soils. And of course, if we want to restore food webs at home, we can't do what my neighbor's done here with his 32 calorie repairs. He's got 10 acres. And every plant he's put on the 10 acres uh, is a non-native plant. <clears throat> now, why, why did he do that? Because that's what everybody does. He just goes to the nursery, and he, he looks for a plant that's pretty. He's accepted the culture that says plants are just decorations. Because that's the way we've treated them for more than a century now. So if you go to the nursery, it's got to be pretty. Maybe it could be a screen, an anchor, or a focal point. But it's all about aesthetics. No consideration to the ecological role these plants are playing or could play in your yard, must play in your yard. But we could do that. We could find pretty plants that have food web value, that are protecting our watershed, sequestering carbon, helping the pollinators, doing all those things we need the plants to do at home. So how do we do that? What's a biodiversity-friendly neighborhood look like? This is the most important thing we need to do. 
We need to build biological corridors, connectivity, that connects the isolated habitat fragments that we have. They are out there, but they're also isolated. Who's in between? We are. We've got to put the plants back so that you actually have viable habitat in between those isolated natural areas. If we connect those natural areas, they're not isolated anymore. And that means the populations within them aren't tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, they won't disappear anymore. This is the single most important thing we can do to stop the steady drain of species from our neighborhoods. Where are we going to put all those plants? I suggest we put them in the area that's in lawn. Why? We got 45.6 million acres of lawn. Eight New Jerseys. Eight New Jerseys of lawn. We're adding 500 square miles of lawn each year. And now that we've got, got lawn as a status symbol in agriculture, it's probably a lot more than that. Nobody's measured it recently. <clears throat> well, why do we do that? Lawn is a status symbol. In the old days, only rich people could have lawns. So it's, it's been a status symbol for a long, long time. And then we invented the lawnmower uh, around the turn of the century, and all of us poor slobs could, could have lawn. But then in, in the, we keep raising the bar. In the 50s, if you didn't have a perfect lawn, you were a communist. And today, of course, you watch the fertilizer commercials. If you have a dandelion in your lawn, you're just not a good person. And your neighbor will hate you. But you know, we can change. We can change our status symbols. I went to Montana a few years ago and I looked around, they didn't, they didn't have big lawns. So I asked my host, where are your big lawns? Uh, and he said, we only get nine inches of rain a year. Of course, that doesn't stop them in Arizona, but, <clears throat> uh, but he said, you know, lawns are not our status symbol. I said, well, what is? He thought about it and he said, big belt buckles. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Because if we double the size of our belt buckles and cut the size of our lawn in half, I think we can, we can do it. And of course, what are we going to place the lawn with with these very powerhouse plants that are going to support all of the diversity we need them to support? This is what we've done in the past. We build our house, put in the, the uh, um, foundation planting, put a few trees here and there, then we're exhausted, and lawn becomes the default. No more landscaping. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and now figure out where we do want lawn, where we do want turf grass. We're not going to get rid of it because it's the perfect plant to walk on wherever you walk. So look at your property and think about where you want to walk. I look at where my neighbors walk on their 10 acres, which is mostly lawn. Nowhere. They're never outside. <clears throat> well, what if you want to get married in the front yard? You need some lawn there. If you want to walk to the backyard, you need a path. Uh, throw the frisbee, have a barbecue. What are we going to do in your yard? That's where the lawn goes. And then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. And this is the landscape design challenge of our time. So we have any designers here, any landscape architects? Okay, the ball is in your court. Figure out how we can do that. How can we get all these plants into our neighborhoods without it looking wild and messy? Because I know people don't like wild and, and messy. And if we convince our neighbors to do the same thing, and we've got the connectivity with the woodlot over here and the woodlot over here. And not only have we, have we stopped the drain of species from this neighborhood, we've reversed it. They will come. And I know that works because on our 10 acres at home that was mowed for hay when we moved in, we now have 54 species of breeding birds because we put the plants back. It's not very hard. You still have lawn, so we can still play with our lawn mowers. It'll be okay. Now, if we do this in half the area that's in lawn, let's make the math simple. We've got 40 million acres, cut it in half. We can build a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. We're going to do it at home, so we'll call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So let's do that. Let's take areas that look like this. This is the entrance to the Toledo Zoo with a very nice uh, unmowed lawn here with dandelions. And let's put this, this in. And you know what? When they did this, the board of directors went crazy. They said, nobody's going to come to the zoo anymore. They want those dandelions. <clears throat> let's take an area that looks like this and turn it, turn it into this. We're simply putting the plants back. So forget the native versus non-native. We're, we're, what we're doing is, is eliminate, or getting rid of the idea that humans are here and nature someplace else. Now we're going to be in the same place. There's actually a lot of nature here. These are big live oaks supporting a lot of things. This is a, a, the little properties down in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. That's a typical property. Here's the next, next door neighbor's property. All native plants in a very tiny space. We can do it. 
Here are those uh, lawns out, and uh, this is Iowa, next to agriculture, miles and miles of that. Could be this. And, and that's in Iowa, too. People are starting to do it. We could take these square things here. <laughs> we could put some plants back. This is a high-end property on, on Fishers Island where the, where the Roosevelts live. I should have included more of the house. Uh, very fancy property. But this property is doing everything I had in a list there, except supporting the pollinator. So let's put a pollinator garden in, too. And then we're, we're doing that as well. Now, this is a mulch sculpture that proves you cannot use native plants formally. Except nobody told the folks in, in Indianapolis, this is a formal garden, all with native plants. And of course, that's, a, that's an urban legend. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And it's OK because they're non native plants over there. So it works. This is a corporate landscape that invites the employees to come out at noon to get sunburn. <clears throat> Could be a lovely setting like this. This is the, the lake at, at Mount Cuba Center. Um, and 15 minutes in a setting like this has proven to have measurable medical benefits. Your blood pressure drops, your stress hormone, your cortisol drops, uh, your cancer is cured, you don't get divorced anymore. All kinds of wonderful things happen. Why do I say that? Well, the, the research is showing that you get the same benefits that you get from intense meditation. And that's been shown to boost your immune system also, if you spend that 15 minutes uh, in, in a setting like this, it restores your attention span. Our attention span is eroded from the time we wake up in the morning all day long. By the time we go home, we yell at our spouse. We're just ragged. Well, this will restore it, make you a nice person again. But you can't go to Yellowstone for two weeks in the summer and expect that to last the rest of the, of the year. You've got to do this every single day. And the only way to do it every day is to live in a setting like this or work in a setting like that. So I'm going to put another ball up here, call it mental health. <clears throat> we could call it physical health. If you put a tree outside of a hospital room, the patient gets better faster. If you put a tree outside of a classroom, test scores go up. And they've done this a number of times, and people are scratching their heads. Why, why? The connection seems to be with stress. When you lower stress, and plants apparently do that, you do everything better. You think better, you heal better, you're a nicer person, you learn better. You can also add three things to your, your uh, property, to your life, that may not be there right now, and that is surprise, anticipation, and entertainment. By surprise, I mean you can't walk into a, a property like this or a landscape like that without seeing something you didn't expect to see. If you look at your liatris up close, you might see the camouflage looper that's busy clipping the little petals of the liatris and gluing it to its, to its back until pretty soon it looks just like the flower. Maybe you'll see the green, green leuconicta, or maybe you won't see the green leuconicta if it's sitting on a, a fence post that's filled with lichens. There it is right there, by the way. Maybe you'll see the, the puss caterpillar with this cute little top knot. How cute is that? <clears throat> or the hag moth, ooh. Maybe you'll see the, the, the uh, evening primrose moth, and where are you going to see it? Hiding in the evening primrose flowers. That's where they are during the day. Maybe you'll see this dead leaf up here, which is actually a caterpillar. That is the caterpillar of the showy emerald. Or maybe you'll see the fawn sphinx, which I think is art in the garden, just beautiful. And this is one of those ash specialists, by the way. This guy will disappear if we lose our, our ashes. Maybe you'll see the spingicampa caterpillar. Now, I show this to adults, and they say, ooh, is it going to sting me? I show it to my three-year-old granddaughter, uh, Zoe, and she says, ooh, is it tickly? It is not going to sting you, and it is tickly. Anticipation, throw away your calendars. You can figure out when the seasons change by what is happening in your yard. At our house, spring comes when the toads sing or when the woodcock starts a display. And I get to, we anticipate that. You know, if I'm, I'm out giving a talk someplace, I, I call up Cindy, I said, have the toad sung, have the toad sung. She says, no, 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 no. Then finally she says, yes. <clears throat> and that is, a, that is just a message of hope that I look forward to every single year. It means nature's still happening. As a matter of fact, nature's happening where it didn't used to happen. We didn't have any toads on our property before we put in a little pond, and there they were. So you can create it. We know it's midsummer when the white line sphinx pollinates the evening primrose. We know it's fall when the juncos come. And by the way, it's not fall yet. They haven't shown up, but they will. Here? OK, maybe tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> OK, entertainment. Walk by, I walked by a uh, bottlebrush buckeye two years ago. 17 swallowtails flew up from that, that single bush. 
You can't walk through a cloud of 17 swallowtails without a smile on your face. But does that mean your yard has to be 100% native? No, it really doesn't. I just want you to understand what each plant is doing in your yard and what it's not doing. Don't assume they're all equal because, because they're not. Let's use crepe myrtle as an example here. Now this is the quint quintessential decoration. You can get it in any color. It's not too tall. It's got exfoliating bark and people plant it all over the place. And as you go further south, they plant it all, all over the place. By the time you get to, to South Carolina, it's the only plant in the state at this point. <laughs> what is it contributing to food webs? Nothing. So what's, what's pretty but biologically inert? I always think of statues. But how many statues? You know, one or two, one or two works, but you can have too many. How do you know when you've succeeded? This is, the, this is the main way you know you succeed, when you've got holes in your leaves. Now, this is a little different way of thinking about gardening, but think about it. If you don't have any holes in your leaves, your plants have not passed on any of their energy, and that's it. You have no trophic levels uh, above them. This is a shingle oak leaf. It has passed on part of its energy to a caterpillar that is now in the belly of a bird. So you have living things in your yard because this oak tree was willing to do that. So Greg Nace at the, the Pittsburgh Botanical Garden calls this holistic gardening, and I think that's great. People say, where are the fireflies? I used to have them when I was kids, or the lightning bugs, and I don't see them anymore. So if they come back, you're doing something right. Of course, they're not flies or bugs, they're beetles. That's what the adult looks like. The larva, I've got to put a picture of a larva in here. They live in leaf litter. They're predators in leaf litter where they're eating other arthropods and, and worms. So if you rake up all your leaf litter, if you neaten up so that there's nothing on the ground, you've thrown away where the, the, the fireflies live, where they reproduce. If you have chemlon, you've poisoned them. If you have security lights up all night long, you've messed up their, their communication. So if you get fireflies back in your neighborhood, you're doing some things right. And of course, if you have breeding birds, you're doing a lot of things right because you cannot have breeding birds unless you have the amount of food to support them. And remember what the Donald says. Make America native again. 